In this video, I'm going to share some of my opinions and approaches to using Google Classroom for distance learning. Recently, my head teacher got in touch with me and gave me some really positive feedback from a pupil voice session she'd been taking part of. Um, and so I have thought very carefully about how I've been using Google Classroom and maybe sharing that information with the teaching community. Um, again, I think it's really important that teachers always reflect on their work and you know, see if things are working or not and try and improve them. So I'm sure lots of people have been using this platform in loads of different ways, but this is just some of my experiences. I wanted to share that with people. If there's just one piece of information in this video that you can pick up on, then that would be useful and maybe helping with your teaching moving forward. Now, I am no way in any way a Google Classroom expert. I've been using it just a few months. There's a lot of things I'm sure I can improve on as well, but these are just some of my experience experiences from the last few months. So when I sat down to plan this presentation, I started to think about how I've been structuring my lessons um, and I came back to the TEAT principles. So uh, a couple of years ago, we started in my school uh, working on our TEAT training, which is the Teacher Effectiveness Enhancement Programme, and I am level one TEAT trained. So applying all those principles of lesson structure to what I've been doing with Google Classroom uh, made the most sense to me. So that's how I've approached uh, this presentation. So when I started to break down my videos, I came up with these four main points. That I started off each lesson with a video briefing and I gave the instructions to the class of what they needed to do. Uh, then I included materials, website links or YouTube links for um, independent research they could follow or look at and read these materials. Uh, then I included some kind of activity and then I provided feedback at the end. Now, when I started looking at it a bit more closely, then I started thinking, actually, I'm using a lot of the TEAT principles. So that's what led me to this presentation and breaking it down into the different TEAT sections. So if you're not aware of the TEAT principles, this is the main TEAT cycle that you'll be presented with. It starts off with preparing for learning, agreeing learning outcomes, presenting new information, constructing meaning, apply to demonstrate, and then finishing off with a review before you start the whole process again. So that is how I've been breaking this down. Now, when it comes to preparing for learning, I've been including a short video briefing and instructions at the start of each lesson. I've included some of the learning outcomes in that briefing as well to give context to the pupils about what they need to do and why. Then I'll move on to presenting new information, and I'll go through later on what type of things I've been including. Then we move on to constructing meaning activities or apply to demonstrate activities. Now I've been using those you know, kind of interlinked and I haven't been using both of them in each lesson. I have been mixing and matching. Some activities have just been trying to develop the, the meaning of the information, but also other activities have been trying to demonstrate their understanding of it. And then finishing off with the review section and me giving feedback on pupils' work. Okay, so every lesson starts off with a video briefing. I've been really consistent uh, so far giving a video briefings every single lesson. And I thought this was quite important that I'd have that regular contact with the class and they could see me every day actually getting up and preparing for that lesson. I would introduce the topic, but it's also been useful to give some general feedback from previous work. So I've been giving lots of praise, but it's also been really useful to clear up any misconceptions or activities that pupils just struggled with uh, from the previous lesson. I make sure I go through the aims, so I state exactly what they're learning and why it's important and how it links in with the rest of the unit. Um, I have been including some brief information about the lesson. So I've been starting off with a few quotes recently, a few definitions of kind of the basic concepts for that lesson. And definitely for weaker groups, I included a lot more information in my video briefing. So I would add a lot more uh, clearer information about the general topic and the activities. And I'd provide loads of different examples of what they actually have to do. Um, also, if I've been giving them multiple tasks, I make sure that's really clear. Um, what I started off doing was setting two tasks and pupils would do it in the wrong order. So now I always um, you know, name them task one and task two, so they make sure they do it in the correct order. Uh, last thing I've been doing in the video briefings is giving them some kind of timings. Uh, our school have been doing 45 minute lessons recently, so I've been trying to break that down into how long each activity should take. 
Uh, a lot of my lessons contain an activity which is around about 15 minutes and another activity which is about 25 or 30 minutes. Moving on to presenting new information. So there's been loads of stuff I've been including. I've had lots of feedback of pupils saying this has been really useful. So any kind of reading materials, so um, information sheets that either I've written or found from a website, uh, linking in news articles, but also I've been condensing some of these new art, news articles and putting them in a separate document and highlighting sections as well for groups. Um, I've really been using lots of different websites for geography work. So Time for Geography, BBC Bite Size has been really useful for a lot of the topics we've been doing. Um, and I suggest links. I make them optional as well, so it's not always that you have to look at these uh, pieces of information. Sometimes it's an optional activity and it's really good for extending pupils as well that if I give them a few more websites to have a look at, if they've got a bit of extra time at the end or they want to find out more information. I've been trying to include lots of YouTube videos. As geography is very visual, uh, it's been really good to show pupils a lot of these things that we're talking about and show real life examples and case studies. So they have been really powerful for some of my uh, lessons. I've been creating my own worksheets as well as using worksheets from uh, previous lessons, which has included some information, but also some questions as well and notes. So it's kind of mixture. Sometimes it's really good to use figures and different sources uh, for some of this work as well. And the last thing is I've been using the video briefing at the start to present some new information as well. I really try to limit the amount of information I'm presenting and only really give them an overview. Uh, so I'm not just rambling on for ages. Um, it's really good to display some photos and diagrams as well so they know exactly what you're talking about. When it comes to constructing meaning, uh, we want to create activities that they have to develop their understanding of the topic. So we've got worksheet activities, which I've been creating my own or using existing. Uh, I've been create, getting them to create presentations uh, using Google Slides, which works really well with Google Classroom. Um, but also I've been creating some templates as well. So definitely for weaker groups, I've been including templates that has some of the information filled in and go give them a guideline of how many slides they should be doing and what each slide should contain. Um, I've asked them to create some fact sheets, so that's just some basic research, and they can just use that uh, on the presentation on Google Slides or just the Docs app. Um, they can add pictures into it, they can find information, and I'm not really worried about them writing all the information themselves. It's just a research task and making sure they find the right information for the actual task. And the last thing is them conducting research. So I'm not always looking for direct evidence that they've completed this research. They can present it in different ways using docs or using Google Slides. Uh, but also I've been moving on to quizzing them later on in the lesson or the start of next lesson on what they've actually been learning about. So I don't necessarily need to see all the evidence of their actual research um, and I'll find out whether they've actually done the work in another lesson or later on that lesson. When it comes to apply to demonstrate, we want to see evidence that pupils have understood the information and be able to apply it to the correct situations. So again, the questions and worksheets I've been creating uh, go for a slightly different approach and really want to be kind of testing and challenging the pupils a bit more. So I've been creating a load of question sheets. I've just been doing this on docs and then listing the questions down the document. And that's just the easiest way I found of being able to quickly review it, scroll through that document um, and give them some feedback on each question. Um, if you, you know, tick the box when you're assigning using Google Classroom, you can create a copy for each student and that's the easiest way that then they can just write directly on that worksheet. Um, multiple choice quizzes. I absolutely love the multiple choice quizzes and I think they're a really efficient use of our time and it really gives us a good idea if the pupils have been understanding the information. So the greatest thing about the quizzes is you can have them to auto mark. So I've been doing a lot of multiple choice quizzes at the end of each lesson or the start of the next lesson just to give me an idea whether they've actually understood the information that we've been going through. If you're teaching multiple groups, it's really useful because you create one quiz and then you can assign it to multiple groups. And it gives you just a quick assessment. With the auto marking feature, it's just a couple of clicks of the button and you can see how many marks the pupils are getting. And if you need to then look at pupils that really didn't understand the information, you can go and look at their actual quiz sheet and see where they've gone wrong. 
Um, it's really low stakes. I've been, I think the pupils have really enjoyed them because they don't see it as a massive test and they don't see it as a really scary situation they're in. And it gives them instant feedback. So as soon as they've submitted the quiz, they get their score and they can see where they've you know, made um, correct answers and any incorrect answers as well. So they can have a review of it straight away. Another apply to demonstrate task I've been doing is extended uh, answer questions. So uh, again, I've been creating these on a dock. I have the question just at the top of the document with some kind of picture or figure, and then I want them to actually write their longer form answer underneath. Um, when you're setting these activities, I've been giving the pupils a lot longer to work on them, you know, at least half an hour or maybe an entire lesson. Um, I've been stating whether it's an open book type of question or a closed book. Uh, a lot of the times I've been getting pupils to do it open book so they can actually go research it and find the evidence, uh, which is still a big challenge for a lot of the pupils I've been teaching uh, to actually then go and use all the evidence and the figures and the facts in their answer. The last thing is presentations and I'm approaching it where I want to challenge them a bit more with the apply to demonstrate. So I have made it a little bit more challenging with each slide and I've um, structured it in a more of a question type presentation and want them to be very specific with their information. Moving on to the last part, which is the review. So what I've been using that I find is fairly good is I've just been marking majority of the work out of 10. So if it's just normal classwork, you know, creating a presentation um, or create, you know, doing some research, I'm just marking their work out of 10. And I think most of the pupils understand, you know, with the scores, how well their, their work has been going. Um, if it's uh, an essay question, I've been using like a six marker or a nine marker and giving them some kind of criteria as well about what we're looking for in the answer. So in general, um, if I'm giving the pupils eight to 10 marks, um, that is generally what I'm looking for. I'm pretty happy with the work. Uh, I've just been providing a generally like well done comment or well done, it looks really good. Um, um, just so they understand that what they've done is exactly what I'm looking for. Now, if they're coming up with like marks of one to seven, then that's where I'm seeing that they need to make some improvements. Um, and then I can go into the comments uh, and then and comment on their work and be very specific about this. This is what you need to include. Uh, I try and refer to the questions. So if I've included four questions, I'll refer to question two and explain this is what I'm looking for in this question, this is what you need to add. Okay, uh, also you can refer back to the instructions or the criteria you've given in the first place um, in the instructions part of the assignment. So literally, I'm just copying and pasting some of this information that I gave them at the start of the lesson back into the comments so they, they refer back to it and remember that this is what I asked for in the first place and just reminding them of that fact. Um, when it comes to reviewing the multiple choice quizzes, again, it's auto marked and this just gives us an overall impression of understanding. The pupils get the feedback straight away and then I can go in and just select multiple students and all send them the same message. So again, if you know, five pupils are all getting 10 out of 10, I can write the same message to all five of them just once and it will send out to all of them. Okay, so again, it, multiple choice quizzes, I think, are a really efficient use of your time. Now, this is just my own opinion, but does all the work on Google Classroom need feedback? Now, I would say no. I think a lot of the uh, lower stakes tasks, the research tasks, the creative tasks, don't necessarily need a lot of feedback. But when it comes to essay questions or multiple choice quizzes or anything that you're trying to assess their understanding a little bit more, that is what I'm focusing on giving feedback on. So again, I'd be, uh, you know, try and plan in advance and think about which activities you don't need to include lots of feedback, but then compared to other activities that do need a little bit more information. Um, now, again, when it comes to general feedback, you can select all the, the pupils in the class and send one generic comment to everyone. So you could just write a general statement about how the activity's gone just once and then send it out to all pupils. So that's my quick review of how I've been using Google Classroom during this period of lockdown. Now again, I'm in no way an expert at using this platform, but this is just some of my experiences and how I've been using it so far. Again, I'm creating a few more videos in this series when it comes to using Google Classroom. So if you found this interesting, please go check that out.
Thanks for watching.